Okay, everybody, and welcome this afternoon to the fourth uh, National Orthopaedic Alliance webinar. Follows on from uh, three others, mainly focusing on recovery of elective orthopaedic surgery. However, today we're, we're going to focus on a GERFT project um, led by Professor Tim Briggs. Um, so um, we've been doing this for four weeks now, and we are trying to um, come together on the, the points that are really important to us during this pandemic. Um, our plan for the future is to focus on other topics such as the patient and waiting for surgery, uh, recent publications in the pandemic and um, the international perspective. And in advance, I thank everybody involved in the organization of these webinars, including Anne Hoy and um, Claire Harris in the background. Um, we've had some hiccups in the past, so please, I apologize in advance. Um, all of these things are subject to Wi-Fi connections, etc. So um, I'll immediately go over to Claire and I'm going to stop sharing my screen and we'll kick off. And I think Tim is going to start off, followed by uh, Vinay and then followed by Graham. And then hopefully at about a quarter to two, we'll field some of the questions that come through. Please use the questions and answers format for, um, for submitting your questions. If you have any other issues or problems, please use the, um, the chat form. So uh, over to you, Claire. Thank you. Okay. So Claire, ready to go? So um, I hope you can all hear me and um, it's great to be here. Can we go to the second slide, please? So I'll just give you a little bit of background. It's Tim Briggs here. Um, during the, um, the London pandemic, I was asked uh, to meet up with um, David Sloman and his senior team at the Nightingale in London to ask a, a couple of questions really. And the exam question was, what can we do new in the health service in London? Because it wasn't working that well before COVID and it was felt that post COVID we had an opportunity to do something really different and the idea was to transform healthcare in London to be what David Sloan wants to be, to be world beating. So the, the first thing that was agreed was that within the current constraints of infection control that we have at the moment, and we know that is a pretty fast changing development as you learn more and more about the, the virus, but the key was that the, the GERF methodology was going to be at the center of driving change and using the GERF data metrics in terms of improving quality outcomes. And we all agree that what we wanted as the new norm when we restarted was in London, our trusts to be working at the current de the top decile of performance to become the new normal. And then leading on from that, year on year in continuous improvement of outcomes which we felt would be best for the population, our patients, and indeed, all the staff. We knew that would need harmonization of the clinical pathways and the processes to reduce unwanted variation, which I've seen in all my visits around the country from world-class outcomes to outcomes that were unwarranted and needed to change. In London, we have five STPs becoming ICSs, uh, in the London region, which has a population of over 8 million. And the idea is for each ICS to develop a single uh, PTL for orthopaedics, a re single referral management point with a one team approach with staff passports. So if I use uh, where I work at the Royal National Orthopaedic Hospital, I'm in the N North Central London ICS. And if you consider the other hospitals that are there, North Middlesex is there, UCLH is there, the Whittington is there, Barnet Chase Farm, the Royal Free and the RNOH. The idea is to become a one large orthopaedic trauma department of North Central London with a decision on what we do where to maximize the numbers, the outcomes, and therefore we would need staff passports to allow us our clinicians to move between hospitals 
to operate on where it was most appropriate. There has been GERF regional improvement support for the ICSs to develop and deliver their local plans and also the GERF leadership is the idea is that we can hold the ICSs to account for delivery of the top decile performance. So in effect what that's doing is putting clinicians right back in the heart of change, delivering high quality care and driving the system to allow us to do that, which will improve our quality of lives, the outcomes of patients, and will also have a knock-on effect, I believe, in a very positive way in both teaching and also research. Next slide, please, Claire. So the, um, the, the methodology is we've started in orthopedics on ophthalmology, and we are moving quickly to then include ENT, urology, gynecology, uh, spinal surgery, and general surgery. And then we're gonna follow that with other surgical and medical specialties. Uh, because we now have the data, both at a trust level, network, and ICS level. What we've appointed in the, uh, in the region in London, just to get it off the ground, we've appointed five GERF clinical coordinators for each of the ICS, for each specialty and we've appointed a similar number in, in, in ophthalmology. What we're working on and we'll have ready within the next two weeks is dashboards at ICS level allowing us to look at everybody's performance in terms of outcomes, readmission rates, infection rates, etc. And what we'll then be able to do is benchmark that to the top decile to demonstrate what we've got to do, what are the decisions we've got to do and make to drive the change that's going to produce the functionality at the top decile. We've started to produce best practice clinical pathways, working with the BOA and we'll work very closely with the special societies. And really it leads on from what BASC are developing regarding the revision knee, um, uh, revision knee replacement, infected knee replacement pathways and the number of, of centres we need to do that sort of work. The British Hip Society are going to do something similar. We've already seen it with the British Elbow and Shoulder Society. And we also expect that to see from the ankle um, group and also uh, revision shoulders. We're also going to produce, we're also going to be, be asked to, to develop the Girth Academy because this is going to need a, a lot of support, not only for clinicians who want help to understand it, although I think most clinicians know exactly what Girth's all around, about, but we are going to have to show it to what, to trust executives, to coups, to, to medical directors and management systems within trusts so they can support us and understand what we're trying to do to drive the change and also to drive annual continuous improvement. And I think what's exciting about this is that certainly in London, we've just had our second meeting today with an ICS. Already the ICSs in London are beginning to learn where they sit, where they're, where they're behind, where they're ahead, and what other ICSs can learn from each other. We will certainly give direct input from, the, from myself, provide the expert advice, guidance, and membership along with the national team. And also there will be regional GERT improvement teams to support the delivery. Next one, please. So as everybody knows, as we go into the recovery, there are, it's, it's in four phases. And we're, at the moment we're in, in now in June, so we're starting in phase two and we've got two ICSs that are just about to start some elective um, um, uh, orthopedic surgery now and some others on about the 14th or 15th of June and then phase two will morph into phase three and then by April 2021 we'll be into phase four. So you can see at the bottom there we've got the permission to operate on the clinically urgent patients. We're then going to make sure we do those patients at the right place at the right time, work out our green pathways. Uh, we want a gold standard um, hospitals in where we can do our elective. So that we give the patients the most confidence in terms of IPC. And you can see we're starting with the GERFT um, centers. And as we increase, will allow us to do the volume and complexity uh, with the caveat regarding IPC uh, uh, control. And by end of phase three, beginning of four, we'll be doing the routines uh, work. What has been interesting is that we're just writing out with the Royal College of Surgeons 
uh, we've already done some uh, with, uh, with the BOA and uh, the other special societies to try and get a high um, take on what's happening with patients and waiting lists. And certainly it's very variable on what patients want to do. If you've got a cardiac issue, then you, you get, if you don't have an operation, then potentially there is a significant risk to yourself. And so far in there, there's only been a 5% drop off. But in other, in other specialists, uh, in groups such as all the Phoenix, depending on where you are and where you go, some of the, the fall off of patients deciding to take themselves off waiting list for good is 20%, and another 20% saying, I want to come off the waiting list at the moment, but I may come back to you at a later time. So we need and we have to get an absolute caveat on what is our waiting list at the moment. And I've asked the, the groups in London to review their waiting list, which is going to have knock-on effect and give us some time i believe to get things right next one part of this is all about how we do things best how we develop best practice pathways to make sure we get our length of stay right we reduce our readmission rates we make sure that our revision rates uh, at one and five years are, are at, the, at the right end of the spectrum we want to be and part of that is the best practice pathways which we which we are delivering. Vinny? Yeah, uh, thank you, Tim. Uh, uh, so, uh, as I present uh, what we have done with best practice pathway, I just need to acknowledge uh, contributions of Royal Free Kings and Northumbria. I think we have really worked on. Uh, it's really there. The, the the paper is really based on their core work. Uh, I appreciate uh, that there are other centers in the country which are also doing a lot of work and as this paper develops, uh, that will be incorporated. Uh, I also need to acknowledge uh, clinical leads from GERF, Mike Swart and Chris Snowden who have really contributed to this and, Herney, uh, and Henry Mordock is one of my colleagues here who has got a great interest in pre-op assessment. So uh, the principle is what Tim has said, one ICS pathway, one team approach, and essentially clinical clinician passport so that work, they work in COVID protected sites, okay? Uh, I have shared this document with the BOA and this morning I got the first feedback. So we will continue to work on that and very pleased that the principles of the document have been accepted. Uh, the, 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 uh, like Tim said, there's a lot of work going elsewhere. I attended a pan London vascular meeting yesterday, uh, and it was again on similar lines. Uh, the challenge is if there's a crisis, there's a limited timeline, so uh, we have to make it operational, and at the same time, we have to engage with everyone. So that's always challenging. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, well, this is a busy slide, but this kind of gives you an idea of how the pathway will look. It does go into uh, seven categories. Now, uh, what is important to understand is as GERV develops, it will be uh, it it will be working with the integrated care system. So there's a fair bit of input you have to put in primary care. Uh, the Final document has got an operational pathway where we talk about theater scheduling. We kind of challenge the integrated care system to give us figures with that patient level, really, the uh, patient level information with regards to costings, not in addition to clinical outcomes. Uh, we will require, the GERF will challenge about what we need for IT improvements so we get virtual clinics going uh, and as clinicians move across sites. Uh, and like Tim said, there'll always be a challenge about different ways about procurement and amount of money that could be saved there. Uh, uh, so the ICS document is essentially GERF working at an ICS, the document is essentially GERF working at an ICS level. The other key principle is that every patient should go to the enhanced recovery program. So, uh, uh, so, so this is how it will work. It is, uh, and, and there's a fair bit of detail um, a bit in the paper at each stage what we would recommend. Uh, obviously that can change locally and according to uh, what the uh, local considerations are. Next slide please. Okay, so like Tim said, the, the recommendation first is inpatient elective work should be centralized to one COVID, uh, uh, COVID secure area with ring fence elective wards. Uh, we are expecting the ICS to 
model their demand and capacity as if that area works in the top decile of what model hospital and GERF metrics show. And that is a critical bit. Uh, so we, the idea is not to work what would, what would be the average in the present metrics. We have to move to the top decile, okay? And there will be one PTL per subspecialty to minimize wait times. Clinician passport so they can move between um, hospitals and there is an expectation uh, with regards to positive surgeon volume and outcome and uh, uh, and that is what we'll have to go into the most common procedures or the most unusual procedures as well. Uh, productivity needs to model on the basis of four cemented primary joint replacements on an eight hour cutting list. Uh, that's that to be an expectation. Next slide please. And like I said, each patient should be treated to the top docile of an enhanced recovery program. So there are centers which are achieve, achieving uh, length of step just two days for primary hips and knees. Uh, 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 and that would, and what the challenge would be is to achieve that, what does an integrated care system need to do? Uh, we have to streamline patient pathways. So the expectation uh, for ICS would be to have proper advice and guidance systems to improve communication encourage virtual consultation, a good uh, positive thing in the COVID crisis. Uh, we will look at the way the M uh, MSK specialist triage referral management systems work, uh, uh, the productivity of those and how they can help to improve the pathway. There'll be an insistence on a, re a regular job plan, multidisciplinary team meetings with clear terms of reference about decision-making and the governance of clinical and efficiency metric, metrics. In, in the final document at the moment, we have, I think, uh, 19 governance metrics and 14 efficiency metrics. But Graham will uh, talk a lot more about the metrics later on. And an investment in patient education programs, so joint school with appropriate uh, and comprehensive professional, multi-professional input, uh, because that is what will uh, get the length of stay down. Next slide, please. Now, uh, most of the units were working with a pretty long waiting list, and this is going to make the issue more difficult. So we would expect each ICS to have a clear policy to assess clinical harm, and if patients can be operate, operated or followed up as appropriate. Um, and we would like to, uh, the ex expectation also would be that if we have a comprehensive elective surgical service provided over six days, and a comprehensive support and inpatient service over a seven day standard. So we have the same standard seven days of the week. Uh, so I, I don't want this to be confused between seven day working and a seven day service and a seven day standard. They're all three separate things. As clinicians move from one side to the other, uh, it is critical that protocols are standardized, infection control procedures are standardized, who checklists, they should be more or less the same in every hospital or practically the same. What you don't want is a clinician going to a place and who checklists are different at different places because that causes a patient safety issue. The recommendation is there is a single spinal anesthesia for elective patients, hip and knee joint replacement whenever possible. Again, standardized post-op pain management, standardized inpatient therapy and clinically discharge criteria. Next slide, please. Uh, one of the critical bits which comes from for is patient experience. And, uh, and if a patient brings up hospital, they have to ring up multiple people to get an idea when their appointment would be, when where they're on the waiting list, who will call them. So the idea is that each patient has a single point of contact. Uh, First appointment should be within six weeks of referral, shared decision-making uh, right throughout the property, which is documented. I have in this document, in the first instance, I have said uh, that we should have consent virtual clinics. The idea being that consent is an ongoing process, but as clinicians move, and it's quite possible that if there are waiting times and patients will move from a clinician to the other because the pathway will be held centrally, uh, the idea is that we need a fixed time somewhere in the pathway where once the surgeon has met that patient, he or she will be the surgeon when they come on the day of surgery. So what you don't want is a situation where the surgeon and the patient meet the first time on the day of operation. So there has to be a critical point in the pathway where you say that henceforth the surgical team will be the same. Uh, 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 the, the reality is that it uh, is the wait times are so long, so you would expect patients to move from one clinician to the other. Uh, 
uh, pre-assessment teams, there has to be an investment in the pre-operative assessment teams. We need clinical pharmacy pain management. So if you look at the various POAC systems that are different uh, 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 across every hospital, that needs to be standardized and the pre-assessment should be at least six weeks before surgery. And next slide, please. Um, so again, th these are really basics that are not, not uh, rocket science, but again, it's about standardizing anemia screening, management of diabetes, admitting the patient on the day of surgery, understanding the patient experience and staggering admissions. Uh, and the critical bit is what prosthesis is used. So this is the, or the it should be an ODEP 10 A rated prosthesis for all patients, unless there's an exception or there is, uh, uh, there is a uh, plan for any novel or different prosthesis should be, uh, to be used. Uh, and, the, uh, and we all know about beyond compliance project and the incorporation of that project into this. Uh, the recommendation is use of joint replacement as per best practice recommendations and 80% of primary hip replacements in patients over 70 should receive cemented or hybrid prosthesis. Next slide. Um, so, so, so Tim, Tim Sullivan talked about the GERF academy, and Graham will probably add more about it. But uh, uh, so in addition to the GERF deep dives, the idea would be how we implement it and support various uh, departments and hospitals uh, uh, to achieve what would be the best thing for a patient. Uh, and uh, that is what I'll finish and pass to Graham, really. Sorry about that, I was muted. Um, afternoon everyone, uh, I'm Graham Lomax, I'm the Deputy Delivery Director for GIFT. Uh, so I've been with the programme about two and a half years now, uh, focusing on uh, implementation, so initially in London and then uh, nationally. Um, so um, I, what, I, I see this project really as an opportunity to, to, to kind of turbocharge our efforts in implementation and really take on board a lot of the feedback we've had from trusts over the last year or so in terms of what would really add value and, and help them on the ground. Um, so just, just adding to the, um, to the comments uh, about the academy. So in the first instance, this is really about supporting the local leadership, uh, making sure everyone's fully conversant with the GIRF data, uh, the, the methodology, uh, the, the, the best practice, um, also with some practical help. And you know, Binet's just, just articulated what, what one of those sources of practical help. Um, and kind of bringing that community together really so that so that those leads will have much uh, more ready access to the national clinical leads for advice and, and support um, as, as they kind of develop and, and deliver their plans and I think there's a lot of potential to expand this so so we're quite keen to get digitized content and you know in the past we've often suggested trusts uh, should go and visit other, other providers that's still a good good uh, option um, but actually you know that that does take time uh, and um, and cost, frankly, to travel around the country so we can hopefully bring a digitised uh, offer to try and reduce the need to do some of that. And then just, just running along the side, I think it's just worth mentioning that continuous improvement approach, and, and, and Tim did reference this. So, you know, we're talking about top decile, but of course that will keep moving. So this isn't about setting uh, a new standard and then staying at that standard. This is about continuous improvement methodology, still looking for innovation and to capture that innovation. So we see this as a helpful vehicle to, to disseminate those uh, more quickly. Uh, okay, next slide, please. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the dashboard uh, that was referred to earlier. But I see um, this as a, a key enabler, really. Um, now, this isn't new data, this isn't new metrics. Um, so some of this is not going to be a, a great surprise to people, but there's, I think there's three main aims that we're trying to achieve here. Uh, one is it's about working at system level. So previously we've had you know, single and uh, single trust data packs. And again, on Mother Hospital, we can be a bit fiddly uh, choosing your peers and what have you. So actually, if we're talking about using a, a system by default model and asking leads in an ICS to harmonize pathways, et cetera, then we need to have a, a, a provide the data at that level to make it more user friendly. So this dashboard is a way of doing that. And the second thing is the timeliness. Uh, again, that's been a, a, a constant challenge, really, with the GERF data. Uh, initially, when they were at a point in time with data packs and, and also to a certain extent, model hospital. So there is um, a work stream at the moment where we will be using SUS Plus data, uh, and that will enable us, so it will be relatively live. So it'll be about four weeks behind. And what that means is, is that when we're uh, making an intervention or changing something, we can actually track the pro progress, whereas sometimes in the past, 
we almost had to wait for, for a, a number of months by which time you slightly lost the opportunity to drive momentum. So, so timeliness is really important. And the, the third thing is that point about aspiration, really. So again, we've often had data uh, showing your position against the median. And we know, and, and you know, sometimes we do discuss the fact that the median isn't isn't necessarily great. Um, but actually, you know, trusts have said to us, and certainly said to me, is you know, they, they want to be more, they want to be challenged further, uh, and, and, and and that that position isn't good enough. So in, in these these slides, we'll see now we are benchmarking against that top decile, and also putting a quantification against that in terms of what the Fed's opportunity is. But I just think it's helpful from a kind of materiality point of view in terms of um, look, looking where to focus. So we've developed this uh, prototype. Um, I'll just go through a few screenshots. I won't go through everyone in detail, but really just to give you the flavor. Um, so Claire, if you could uh, move us on, please. Uh, so just, just the starting point, I guess the welcome page is so we can go on the left there. You can see you can start looking at uh, inpatients or uh, day case or procurements or, or the theme, uh, or you can go by the map, uh, if you hover over your ICS uh, or indeed go to a trust level. Next slide, and uh, this one. So, so, so the way the way it's essentially structured is it starts as the kind of specialty and regional overview, and then you drill down into a more procedural level and indeed ICS and trust level. So you can do that with with, with all of these. So just the starting point is, is straightforward activity levels. So you can see the trend uh, in London. Uh, we've split it out actually in terms of so it's all NHS activity, but we'll split out between that that's undertaken in NHS hospitals versus the uh, those undertaken in benefit sector hospitals. Clearly, in some reasons, we will have an aspiration to um, to make sure there's capacity in within the NHS providers in the long term. So I think that will be an important uh, uh, view to look at. Okay, next one. And then again, this is so this is all of London, all of orthopedics. So the length of stay opportunity. So by moving to top decile. So this is all. You know, this isn't. Um, uh, th this is all delivered elsewhere in the NHS. Uh, we could achieve 21,400 bed day reduction. Again, it's easier said than done. Clearly, but this is this is what we're. Uh, this is the overall opportunity. Uh, and and the second graph is about infections, which actually is is less of an opportunity. There's been a lot of good work done. Next one. So uh, this then goes down to procedure level. So this is uh, primary hip, and this is the activity at the ICS level. And again, you would then click on that and go down to the trust within within the ICS as required. So you can see the trends um, leading into COVID clearly, uh, the trends of activity. Okay. And then again, sticking with uh, primary hip, uh, that's the length of stay uh, by ICS. So again, we can see some variation there. Um, so top decile performance is currently 3.7. Um, so that would be our first uh, target. What I would say is I wouldn't uh, I wouldn't think that, that we'll rest on our laurels too much with that. There are some providers getting some really good clinical outcomes down at 2.3, 2.4 days. Um, so I think 3.7 is, is, is first stop uh, on the way to, to further opportunities, I think. And just those opportunities yeah, quantified by bed days uh, further down uh, uh, on the bottom half of the chart there. Okay. So similar for readmissions and uh, return to theatres, uh, funnel plots, as you'll all know and love from our data. So again, these are areas uh, in London where it's been, the variation has reduced significantly over the last uh, couple of years. Uh, but we can still see there's quite a way to, or there's certainly the opportunity to, to improve further. Uh, okay, next one. Uh, I'll, I'll, I won't go into that one. Next one. So in day case um, procedures, so this is uh, just a trust level and just shows the variation. Um, so this is all orthopedic procedures in the BADS uh, basket. Uh, so nearly 500 uh, uh, procedures there from an opportunity point of view. And then the next slide takes that down so you can go into uh, procedure level. And it's just an example on the next slide. So that's a, a single procedure. Okay, and in the next couple of slides, so we've gone into theatres now. Now, at the moment, so this is theatres data straight from Model Hospital, um, which has a, has an issue from a timeliness point of view. So again, there's a work stream at the moment through Model Hospital where we'll be looking to source theatre data directly. So we've got contemporary um, sources to have regular feeds uh, again. So we'll be kind of four weeks behind. Uh, again, I think that's important. Uh, a lot, a lot of these metrics, particularly theatre theatre metrics, is you always need to look at it in the round rather than any individual. Uh, but you can certainly build a picture up and you know, the average cases for this, for example, 
um, again, will be an important one to, to track as long as you're taking the whole context into, into consideration. Okay, next one. Again, and that's just a quantum. So uh, 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 that, that again is the kind of old data source, but once we've got a new data source, I think that will be a useful metric just to see the opportunities um, uh, that we've got to play with. And then we go into procurement. So um, again, lots of good work on procurement. Uh, and in some of the ICS have done some fantastic work. Uh, it's still, um, but there's still, there's still opportunity there. So it's still quite um, sporadic. There is probably about 4 million opportunity overall. Um, as you can see, there are about 2 million specific on hip and knee. And then down litigation, again, we've seen some good, uh, some, some, some impressive reductions in some of the litigation claims individually, uh, but it is still such a huge number that there's still a lot to, lot to go at. Okay, so that's, that's really just a, a flavour of the dashboard. At the moment, so the prototype is complete. We're working with model hospital to confirm what this is gonna, where this is gonna go in terms of uh, a live um, feed uh, and we hope to have that for London next couple of weeks and then obviously with a view to some, some national rollout. So it's still still work in progress but we will have it to actively work with the London teams over the next couple of weeks. So I'm going to stop there and I think there's an opportunity to um, pick up questions. Okay, um, thank you very much all the speakers. I think we're, we've got six questions in. I think we'll go straight to the questions if that's okay. And um, Tim, um, if you, you can decide who answers which question, if we can keep it fairly, um, fairly concise and brief. Uh, some of the questions coming in are not directly related to the project, but um, I think we still should answer them. So I'm going to take it from the top. Steve Millington asked, how are centres proposing to deal with patients for elective surgery who cannot self-isolate? they still have to be offered treatment recommended by NHS to protect their patients' rights. What do you think, uh, Tim, can we start with you? Yeah, I think that's a very good question, Steve. I think at the moment, uh, I think that if um, patients can't self-isolate, they have to be assumed to be possibly COVID positive and will be treated in that pathway. But then there will be informed consent regarding that about the data of the risks of um, contracting COVID in the perioperative period uh, and about what that might do in terms of morbidity and mortality rates to patients. But I think again, Cormac, this is a moving feast. Uh, we're talking about isolate, self-isolation 14 days at the moment. I hear some people now talking about 10 days, some people talking about seven days, but clearly what we've got to get into a place where we can get rapid testing as they have shown at Addenbrooke's that we can actually bring patients on the day, test them on the day, and then do our, our procedures. And that should then help alleviate some of these issues. Uh, thank you. I think the greener we get, and the, hopefully the reduction in the or not across the UK, uh, again, things will change and, and it will improve. Um, go to Neil Windsor from North Wales. He's asked, we have successfully piloted and we're moving fur further towards day case hip and knee surgery at the Betsy Cadwallader Health Board in North Wales. Is this a best practice pathway? Um, so, uh, so uh, Gormack, oh, sorry, sorry, Tim, go for uh, it. Carry on. No, 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 I, I was, what I was going to say was uh, uh, the pathway uh, that we have proposed uh, uh, has got lots of bits on North Tumria's day case and answer recovery program. So yes, in a way, yes, it is. Uh, uh, as long as we have the clinical outcomes and everything there, that's so that's perfect because that, that kind of reduces the average length of stay because expectation that comes down to two days. Can I just uh, add, I think, I think it, Cormac, it also depend on the comorbidities of the patient. Oh, sure. I think clearly we want, a low, we want a best in class length of stay but that's going to mean a good pre-op assessment, good joint school beforehand, and then early mobilization. And as Vinay said, the appropriate physio and OT on the ward seven days a week, providing the excellence that we need to, for early rehabilitation of these patients. Uh, so, so team, there's going to be competition. I, um, I want to be the green site. No, I've got a better system than you. So you're going to have people competing in areas to be the green site. How do we make the decision on that? Graham, do you want to answer that? 
Um, well, I mean, it's obviously it's for the ICSs to kind of work through their proposals, really. But I think we're there, uh, and having having Tim as part of that process in the centre, I think is really helpful to have that objectivity, um, and and just make sure that we're looking, you know, that the decisions take for the right reason. So it is a bit of a joint effort on that, I think. Yeah. So Cormac, in, in let's use North Central London as an example. So we had eleven centres doing elective work. We've had clinical working groups across not just North Beach, across 18 specialties now being agreed. There will be three centres in North Central London that will do elective work. So we've come down from 11 to three and all the clinicians have signed up to that. I think just, just building on that, actually, there's, a, there's, a, cause th there's been a lot of work gone on over a number of years on, on that principle in North Central London. There's a lot of learning they've done in terms of engaging with the public and how they essentially mitigate some of the challenges about um, access and all the rest of it and I think that's stuff that we can we, will be relevant learning elsewhere in all the other ICSs so so we are thinking about how we um, can share some of that learning. That's great thank you for that now third question from Ahmed uh, Juan Roy is it possible to create to create a formatted electronic consenting rather than paper-based consenting to further minimize close contact with patients and also save paper and the environment? So I would say that we've got to make sure that we've, um, one of the things we're learning in, in the London region actually, and talking to each of the ICSs in orthopedics, is about people are developing different consent forms. And what we want to do is get one joined up, again, involve the BOA in this and the rural colleges, what have you. And then I, I, I can absolutely understand why we make it electronic and something will take yeah. away. But I think again, we're in a different era now. We're now in the post, well, during the, just getting the post-COVID era, but again, just look at virtual consultations, video conferencing. Yes, I think IT is going to play a very big part in, to, as we move forward. And I suppose as well, um, sorry, Vinay, did you want to get in there yeah, as well? I just wanted to add to that because I, I, say, uh, I think that's more a process, but then I think it's important that consenting is not just a form, it's an ongoing process. And uh, so it's, 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 a, uh, it's again, it's again, IT documentation as you see across the pathway and uh, stuff like that really. And that is critical. I think in the present pandemic, some, some uh, hospitals are certainly doing the process, um, documenting the process uh, remotely, and then the actual sign on the form is on the day of surgery. Um, I, I personally think that's uh, good practice. I think that's the way things are going. Okay, we'll move on to another question here um, from Jit Mangwani. Uh, best recommendations for patients who are waiting to have a new patient appointment for elective orthopedic problems. Best way to categorize their COVID risk as quite a few of them are older than 60. Vinay, what's your experience down in Gloucester? Um, so, so just talking about specific to COVID at the moment, we are not taking any referrals from GPs. Uh, um, but but there, are two, there are two sides of it. One is, does every patient come for a procedure? And that's again the part, first part of the discussion is quite, I think is critical. But in the documentation thing, in the referral letter, I think those risks uh, in the GP referral letter from the MSK, those risks have to be identified. Some is more than 70 comorbidities. That's a high risk. Uh, and then that's a judgment call for the clinician to make. Yeah, uh, thank you. I, I think that one of the problems we have is that at the moment we're denying patients face-to-face -face consultations. Some patients are happy with that, some are not. Um, I think the process of having a telephone conversation, seeing how many patients, could I get away with a video call here? Yes, no. Yeah. And when you come to the end of all of that, do I really need to see that patient face-to-face -face and then see them uh, quickly? That's um, my personal view of things. Any further comments on that one? No, there's just a need of clinic, clinical assessment because I think that shouldn't be, uh, when I, I know everything, everyone wants to move to virtual. Uh, there will be a lot of pressure, but the clinical assessment and the need for clinical assessment, uh, I think is very critical. So it has to be some, at some stage, depending on the local circumstances, the patient circumstances, that some says there has to be a face-to-face, -face, at least one, I think, before surgery. But that's my personal view. 
yeah, yeah. For, for, for first first appointments, I think there'll be more face to face, uh, but also it will vary between subspecialties. For hand and wrist, you can do a hell of a lot on a video call um, for hand and wrist. Um, it's a little bit difficult to examine a hip um, on a video call. So um, things will vary, I think, between subspecialties. So I move on to the next uh, question from David Rees. Will there be an opportunity to provide a narrative to the dashboard from a trust perspective? If, for example, there were factors affecting productivity that would only be known by the local specialty. So I think, shall I take that? Yeah, yeah, please do. Yeah, so I think, I mean, in terms of being able to put that on the actual dashboard, probably not. But I think the point is, is that through, um, through this process, through the ICS coordinators, um, etc., that's where you would have that dialogue, uh, go through the data and make sure there's an understanding and, and communicating up the chain about what that is and what the plans are. Um, and, and the other point of that is, so, you know, again, for example, if you had that in, I guess, an old school data pack, you'd have to wait for a refresh and potentially be able to have that argument for, for a little while. Actually, here you'll be able to track, um, uh, you know, what your plans are and what your progress is against that particular issue. So I think it's about, as always, it's about making sure that the, um, the right conversations are being had with the data and with the context. Uh, and again, you've got kind of a backbone, that hotline access to the national specialty lead. Um, to be able to provide that clinical support. That's, uh, thank you. Thank you for that answer, Graham. Um, we'll go on to Dominic Nielsen. Um, with the identified long and growing waiting lists and the theatre capacity likely to remain similar, uh, do you anticipate the proposed efficiency improvements being enough to accommodate that? Which is an interesting question because I think the capacity might go down rather than go up. Yeah. Uh, um, who would like to take that one? So I'll, I'll start and then ask Philly to, put, uh, to um, pop in. So first of all, I think our waiting lists are going to be different. I think it's going to affect different subspecialties in orthopaedics more than others. And I think we need to get a handle on that. As regards productivity and efficiency, I think, yes, at the moment, there is a real risk that our productivity will reduce because of IPC control and what have you. But as we get further, we know more about the virus, we get into rapid testing, then our productivity should be able to improve significantly, I believe. And if you are at the moment doing two joints uh, a day in a, in a theatre, uh, compared to others who are doing five, and those five drop down to three, and we could get everybody to three, then we will see some productivity gains, especially if we do them in a green uh, in a green pathway and on a gold site. So I think that is absolutely crucial. Vinay? Yes, um, uh, so I, I think the pro it's, it's going to be progressive considering the pandemic. The other critical bit is I know we are naturally theater focused, but there is also a fair bit in beds and the accurate length of stay and the money that goes in beds. Uh, and so that's what Graham's data shows is there will be something about actually, you know, if your accurate length of stay, goes, I'm sorry, average length of stay goes down to two days, you're going to release an X number of beds and invest it in more theaters and stuff like that. So it's about getting your money differently and going further really for the same amount but yes i think the problem uh, it, yeah uh, but, but that's but that, that's the other other challenges that bit to the ICS when they model that bit on the top top this yeah. one if you get an idea just, just a quick just a quick point from me on that i think right. um in, in some areas the, the answer will probably be no and there probably will be need, need for some additional capacity in some areas i think the point the principle that we've always kind of worked to is to get that to to, to demonstrate the case for that is we need to be able to show the productivity. So if we can demonstrate we've got the productivity gains and here's the data to show that we still need an extra theatre, whatever it might be, then I think this provides quite a strong uh, case to support that. And that's been demonstrated. You know, we've got lots of examples of simply real off um, uh, of where that's happened within other countries. Excellent, thank you. Um, just moving on to the next question. Actually, when we said we were going to do this webinar, um, um, I've had some contact from a few people who were just wondering about the progress of other GERFT pathways. Uh, so we've got a, a, a question from my colleague Stuart Hay. Um, thanks for your presentation, Tim. Uh, following the GERFT principles through BESS, we produced a document to address elbow replacements. The proposed pathway has been published, consultation process undertaken. 
Um, I'm no longer on the best council, but as first author on the pathway, and the documentation has been submitted to GER for a final decision just before lockdown. Do you have a timeline when this will be ratified and final decisions made so that it can be formally introduced? Yeah, so um, great work, by the way. Um, I'd like to thank you for all that. It'll be ratified very shortly, and we're going to implement it in London. And, and I expect it to be the, become the methodology for driving elbow replacement surgery. Okay, how, how short is short, Tim? Any idea? Over the next two or three weeks, I'd have thought. Okay, thank you. Uh, just comment, just to kind of say, uh, just the next, next bit is to work on a shoulder elbow pathway. So that's some discussion with uh, some of the shoulder elbow colleagues who are on BESS as well. So that's okay. a kind of discussion going on. Thank you for that. Um, Christopher Hume has made a comment here. This is where the passport comes in, into play. Not quite... I don't quite get the question and what he's referring to. Um, I'll just go on to Phil Turner's question. How soon before this is ro rolled out to other ICSs? We had a brief conversation about this, Tim, earlier. Yeah. So I had a conversation with the Midlands region two days ago. The Southwest have been in touch. So I think that um, it will go uh, national. I spoke at the medical advisory group of um, Steve Pass's about last week about it. Um, and there's a lot of interest. There's a lot of interest at the top of the office um, for the sixth floor of Skipton House. I think people are excited about it because it re-engages really well with the clinicians. We'll get what we need to do the job well. And what we've got to do is use best practice to guide and drive practice. So I think it's a win-win for everybody. Thank you for that. Um, Andrew McLaren, uh, what's your proposal for the significant volume of orthopedic work? that was previously done in the independent sector? It's a good question. So how do private hospitals fit into this equation? So at the moment, I think, let's be absolutely honest, I think they've come to the aid of the NHS during COVID in a very joined up way, and, and I would like to thank them for that. I think going forward, what we've got to do is make sure we maximise our NHS estate efficiently, as effective as we can, and then have a conversation with the independent sector but again, what we don't want is just CCG sending off work to the private sector, just getting a whole load of cases done. What we've got to make sure is that the patients go through a common pathway, a common line of, of entry into the system, and the appropriate patients are treated in the appropriate institution. But first of all, let's maximise the potential, as you've seen in Graham's slides in the NHS, uh, and then have that discussion when we, when we have an idea of the real scale of the challenge of the data. Uh, thank you. Any further comments on that Vinay, what, Vinay, what's your comment on that? Um, um, so, um, uh, uh, I think the independent sector um, is a thing, because I think in our, in our patch, um, I, I don't know the latest figures, but I think nearly 30, 40% operating happens in the independent sector. Uh, and uh, the, and it, it, it does link to not just the uh, pandemic inefficiencies. We were inefficient even before. So I know we are kind of focused about saying because of the pandemic, our, our, our theater productivity is going to be down. But I think we were inefficient before. And I think it just comes down to going back to being a very efficient uh, unit uh, and try to get get that all that work back in and, and the the other bit which the paper doesn't uh, talk about is the implications for training and, uh, and stuff like that but, but that's another bit which is very important from an, uh, from what got happened in the independent sector um, thank you for that just as far as passports are concerned I think we have to think about the trainees as well with their passports because they need to be able to follow the work um, so in this, in this uh, reorganization, we do have to think a lot about training and how it's going to be delivered. So Comer, can I just come on that bit? I think that was probably in a way what Chris Hume's uh, oh, point okay. I get had it been. Now. I get uh, it. Because the, there's also other that bit is if everything gets regionalized, what you don't want to happen is find two tier departments. So it may be also about consultants going and working in regional centers. I suspect that is where Chris was coming from. Yeah. Okay. Um, so another question, we'll keep going on to two if that's okay. Um, so from 
Manawar Hashmi, how can we set up clinics in the current pandemic, keeping, keeping patient safety in this group of older patients? That's a, quite a broad, um, broad question, but we'll, we'll field it anyway. Uh, Tim? Well, I, I think at the moment, um, the elderly age group are, are, are still quite frightened about COVID. Uh, and I've had conversations with some of my patients on the phone. And I think that um, for, the, for the short term, I think face-to-face -face, um, is going to be difficult. We've got to demonstrate to patients that they're in the right environment, i.e. green and a gold stand-up if we can. We've got to do use the video conferencing IT where we, we find it very useful. If you've shown Cormac and sort of, you know, hand, wrist and uh, a finger surgery, that sort of thing where we can use that sort of um, that, that IT. But I think that we will get back to face-to-face, -to -face, uh, but it's going to be very different. We're going to have to think about social distancing and outpatients and what have you. So we probably won't see the numbers. So we're going to have to do an assessment and then decide the ones we're going to need to see face-to-face. -face. So I think it is going to be a change for all of us. Okay, thank you. Should we be thinking about going to see these vulnerable patients in their homes or nursing homes rather than sucking them into a hospital environment? Has anybody thought about that? So at the moment in terms of care homes, it's um, significant COVID risk at the moment in care homes. Many of them are still shut down. Um, and I think again, again, Cormac, a lot of it will come to well, we certainly can consider that, we, but I think we as um, colleagues, we're all going to have to make sure that we're COVID negative. Uh, we've introduced at Stanmore daily temperature checks, filling in daily questionnaire, and then weekly tests. So we've got to give the public confidence that when we go there, we are at minimal risk if we do that. Okay, thank you. There's a question from Mandy Chetland. Is there a, a date we can expect the dashboard to be available? to trust outside London. I think, Graham, you sort of hinted on that. Do you want a quick comment on that yeah. one? Yeah, I mean, I mean, the short answer is no, we haven't got a date at the moment. Um, as I said, we're, we're hoping that uh, we'll be using more the hospital microsites for this. Uh, I think we will have a better idea in about two weeks about what the uh, overall rollout position might be. Thank you. Um, Pakash Chandran, sorry, is there another comment there? No. Uh, Pakash Chandran has asked, can GERP provide with a standard risk of mortality and morbidity for additional COVID-19 consenting with the percentages? Um, I'm just trying to read that again, but um, I'm, I'm not quite sure what that's getting at. Maybe. So I think, I think, Comac, so it depends which papers you read from Wuhan or from others. But if, if a patient um, has an operation with a general anaesthetic and they, and they contract COVID in the perpetual period, the mortality rates can be as high as 23%. But on the other side, they've carried on doing cancer surgery in London on, on elective independent sector sites that are COVID negative, and they've had no ill effects. So I think it's very much data learning, data capturing at the moment. And I think it's too early to say, to be honest, about what the risks finally are, but there are risks, there's no doubt about it. Actually, I now get it. Um, can I refer, Pakash, to the recent Lancet publication? It uh, came out on fr late on Friday. Uh, it's led by the uh, Global Centre for Public Health, I think it's called, from Birmingham. So it's led by a, a Birmingham uh, colorectal surgeon. Um, and that has uh, mirrored some of the worrying um, incidents of mortality in um, doing elective surgery during a pandemic. So um, I think that's a very good uh, publication to look at. It has its, um, there is uh, problems with the publication, especially in relation to orthopedics, because although there was about 1500 patients recruited to that international study, I think only about 300 were actually orthopedic patients. But that was, uh, that was quite a good publication released on um, on Friday, and there's also a commentary on it as well. Um, moving on, uh, Mark Loeffler, risk changes with COVID incidents. I think that is uh, an, a comment on a previous question. 
uh, Mandu Rao, do surgeons operate on patients from their own trust patch? Or there, will there be a pool of patient, patients given dates and surgeons expected to operate? There's a, there's a good question. Okay, so the, in London, the idea is in each of the ICS is to have a single PTL. It will allow surgeons to move to different hospitals to do the complexity of the work. But what we will not have is surgeons turning up at a hospital not having met the patients to carry out a procedure. What we want to make sure is this is in the best interest of patients, providing the best outcomes, and also in the best interest of the clinical community. Graham, anything to say about that? Yeah, I think there's, there's an kind of almost administrative point on this because, um, you know, what we're trying to achieve is, is equity of access and, and, and we haven't got that in some areas. Uh, but uh, as you allude to, you, you don't want to be pitching up a meeting surgeon for the first time. So I think if the admin processes are able to direct patients at the, at the point of entry, a referral point, uh, to the surgeon who will be able to do the operation, that some of those issues can go away. Uh, so how what will happen with um, what happens with patient choice? You know, Mr. Kelly did one knee. I want to see him for the other knee, but he doesn't quite tick all the girthed boxes. What happens there? What about the patient who says, "I know my surgeon. Um, I want to go back to him for the other side, please." So I would hope that that will be that will be um, acceptable and fine. Uh, what we've got to make sure is that all patients get, as Graham says access no one's disadvantaged everybody gets the care they do at the top decile of outcome so that's what we're trying to do and encompass as much of this as we can okay moving on andrew mcdowell what are your strategies for approaching the higher risk patients having more major surgery for example the 80 year old with af and diabetes delay surgery until the pandemic is gone or proceed with caution in a green pathway with appropriate consent. Vinay, do you want to answer that? Yeah, I, 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 I think it, 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 it is that shared decision making and that is what it comes down to, is that it depends on the patient's symptoms, signs and, and the risk assessment that the clinician and the patient decides. It's got to be shared decision making. Uh, I don't think so one can answer that yes or no. I think there are patients, the experience so far is there are patients who uh, choose not to proceed with surgery in this pandemic, despite the fact that they tick all the boxes, they're 2A or 2B or whatever, they choose themselves not to proceed during the pandemic and we have to listen to that. Absolutely. So Cormac, can I just say, I've got to leave now for another meeting in one That's minute. Fine. But okay. so I'll leave you the capable hands of Vinay and, and Graham. Thank you. Yeah, we'll be closing up shortly anyway, Tim. Thank Cheers, you very Corey. much for that. Thank you. Okay, so if it's okay, we'll continue for another two or three minutes. Um, Paul Smith asks, how are other centres dealing with patients who are unable to meet the isolation period? Uh, I think that's come up before, isn't it? It has, and I, I've seen it on the board's um, uh, chat as well. Uh, I don't think so. I'll be able to give a comprehensive answer to that one, uh, but I can I put something back in the there's, system. There's significant regional variation around um, self-isolation, uh, depending on the, the type of surgery. In other words, uh, you, it seems unreasonable to ask a hip replacement to self-isolate for the same amount of time as a carpal tunnel. And I think there is regional variation uh, on isolation. And as previously mentioned by Tim, the, 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 the magic number seems to be coming down dramatically day by day. Yeah. And uh, there are some people going to two to three days of isolation now, which I don't know if it makes any sense, but certainly a minimum of seven days apparently seems uh, reasonable. Okay, I'm gonna move on to another question. Should we have a way of prioritizing the more effective category four patients? For example, hip replacements ahead of the less effective ones, e.g. hip arthroscopy. Wow, that's a question nobody wants to answer. I hope there's no hip arthroscopists in the audience. Um, so uh, that sounds an ideal one for Vinay. Well done. Thank you, thank you very much. So, uh, so, so, so my, my take on this is that I think for a foreseeable period, uh, we are going to be going according to clinical urgent cases. I don't think so. We are going to who's first on the waiting list, who's next on the waiting list. 
And I guess, I think that will be for the, in my view, it will be for the clinician to decide if there's something that auto, I'm not an expert on hypotoscopy, but there's something really clinically urgent about that hypotoscopy, then they just have to be justified really. Uh, but, but, but from what I know, I think it'll be a tricky one to categorize a routine operation or clinically urgent operations for a few months at least, I think. I agree. And certainly in shoulder and elbow, I can't see myself getting through an MDT to do a subacromial decompression in the near future. And I think in some respects, it uh, helps us pause and reflect on the, our scope of practice and what works really, really well and what may have unpredictable results. So um, that's a good question from Mark. Uh, moving on, Avek Mitra, with the challenge in structure of delivering service, how is this going to factor in training? Um, we've touched on that, but again, I'm gonna bounce it back to you, Vinay, if that's okay. What do you think about training? Um, so, um, so I, I think as these roles are, we are going to learn about this, and I would think that the uh, the job plans of the trainee, uh, sorry, the timetables of the trainees, we have to accommodate that. Uh, there are models around the country where trainees are gone and, for that matter, worked in the private sector. Uh, so, that, and, and I think your suggestion earlier about trainees' passport is very critical. I think increasingly these HR issues had to be dealt with at an ICS level to, to, to do that. Uh, uh, and I think we have to respond to that in kind, I think, because that's a critical issue. Okay, thank, thank you for that. We've, we've just got four questions, so we'll continue. I understand people need to leave, but we'll hang on in there for a little while longer if Graham and Vinay can stay with us. Um, so I'm going to go on to Asan Rafay's question, to protect our patient, is there any plan to tighten or change our indications for surgical input in high-risk patients for some elective procedures, at least till March next year? Um, so that's an interesting one because we have changed our indications as, as advised by the BOA for trauma. Um, what about elective surgery? It's a good question. Uh, Graham or Vinay? Uh, so, so it's, it's that bit about kind of the ethical and uh, what you call the philosophical discussion making here. Um, uh, uh, so at the moment, the document doesn't say that we have to change our indications for surgical input apart from uh, clinical urgency. So that is what been proposed uh, because the, the, the document essentially is for transition phase and once we come out of the pandemic. So the answer to that is in a larger thing, the answer is no, but there will be some interim adjustments. I think all of us will have to make at uh, levels. I don't I, know, Graham, if you go to add to that. No, no, that's fine. I think we just need to think again about whether we have exhausted conservative management of, uh, of the various conditions yeah. that we have. Um, just our ask, ask ourselves that question uh, instead of once, twice. Uh, Lauren Vandenberg, can you please repeat the other work streams that would be focused on after orthopedics? Yeah, so, um, so in fact, I think someone's answered it for me in the, in the text, but yes, that is correct. General surgery, urology, ENT, spines and gynae. Um, so that's wave two. Uh, there are plans, uh, as you can imagine, Tim is keen that we do all specialties very quickly. Um, so Lauren, uh, I know gastro will be of interest. That'll be somewhere in there, I think. Um, so yeah, but the, those five are the next um are the next okay the next question is from chris Hume, and it's sort of it's been answered by lucy davis but we'll, we'll pose it again so does tim anticipate surgeon and their patient going to a green site which may not necessarily be the surgeon's own institution and i think the answer is yes yeah. i don't know if there's any other com then i do have any comments on that is it good bad um it means so, that you have to get used to a hell of a lot of different teams in different places. So, 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 so my experience about reconfiguration that we, we, we did in Gloucestershire, I think there is, a, there is a learning bit in the beginning, but most clinicians get used to it. Uh, but I guess there is something about in the initial phase how you come to know the team. One of the things the paper does uh, specify, and I didn't say it in my talk, is that it is expected, when we look at theatre productivity, it is expected that theatre teams stay as consistent as they can. Yeah. 
so that is a kind of a cultural change we'll be asking theater teams to do uh, to, just to help that process really but i think that's a good point and i think they will be learning in the initial few weeks yeah i think that's, uh, I think that's, that, that's another reason why it's so important to have some harmonization of processes so that actually uh, you know, it's not as different when you go to a different institution as, as, as perhaps it is at the moment. Um, I think there is a kind of softer element to it, though, as well, of course, in terms of, um, uh, you know, feeling part of a team of the institution, the ICS, and, and those are all things we need to think about. Okay, thank you. We've got two questions left, and I'm going to stop it there. Uh, Claire McKechnie Mason from, from the Orthopaedic and Osteostry, one of my colleagues. What's the role of clinical audit and service evaluation in the GERFT project? with dashboards, best practice pathways, innovation um, that come out of this work to improve patient experience and safety. So where does clinical audit fit into this in the future going forward? Uh, so in, in the paper, once it gets shared, like I said to you, there are very, uh, the MDT is regarded as the core of, going thing, uh, of moving things forward. There are very clearly defined, and this is, this is the uh, first paper, and I'm sure there'll be additions as to what the governance metrics will be, uh, both from uh, and what, what clinical and efficiency. And I think the GERF Academy will, I think, come and play a big role in this as it develops with regards to QI projects, because there'll be ideas at one place uh, uh, and how you kind of make that those ideas national, how you get the change management systems in place. And I, I think that will be a critical bit of this. Uh, I'm sure Graham has got something to add to that. No, just to echo that, I think, um, you know, again, it goes back to that continuous um, continuous improvement and learning um, principles that we've got to make sure are embedded into the GERF Academy. So I think that fits very nicely with that. And I think we will have more audit tools available and more standards. And, and when we have standards, we have a uh, good audit. So I think there'll be, I, I think Claire, there'll be lots more for us to do in the future uh, if this project rolls out. Um, okay, final question. Many thanks for the organization of the session, blah, blah, blah. My practice is in Cumbria. I would like to ask the panel two questions. How can we use MSK to triage the elective referrals? And number two, how and when can we resume the research trials we have prepared and had to stop due to the pandemic? I know on the second question, there's been certainly recent guidance from the NIHR about restarting uh, research and recruitment. Um, so, um, Benet, do you want to give us a maybe for the first question? Yeah, so, so Chris, I think, so I think there, there, there are um, um, ICSs or STPs around the region who have got a very successful MSK triage system. I'm quite happy to have a separate conversation and uh, kind of say uh, which, which those are uh, uh, and how that, is, uh, how that can be helped because that is a significant variation across the country, okay. uh, MSK triaging. Yeah. Thank you. I think it's a big, big, big opportunity, and I'm thinking of one ICS at the moment where there's multiple, there's a lot of variation even within the ICS because there's different commissions and all the rest of it. So we've got to get that sorted. And um, and then finally, just some comments on the research trials and activity. Um, I think it's everything is getting up and running again and recruitment in, in a safe way. Um, that's my understanding. Anything? Anybody know anything else about the um, the progress of uh, Clinical trials? I'm afraid I don't. Okay. Look, I think, uh, I think we're exhausted. We all need a glass of water to cope with our dry mouths. And um, I'm going to thank all the speakers, including Tim, who's not here at the moment, for contributing to this webinar. We'll be having some more in two weeks' time. And then just briefly, if I can share my screen with you. Um, there. I go to my very last slide, which is the close and thank you slide. And um, I like this little saying that I found in a recent publication. Um, and on that note, I'm just gonna close it down. Once again, thanking all involved, uh, Anne, uh, Claire Fallon, all involved in the organizations of, of, these, um, of these webinars. And hopefully we'll see you all in about two weeks time. Thank you very much and I'm just gonna close it now, bye now. Thank you, bye. Bye, thank you. <laughs>